Ladies and gentlemen, I feel like we have to have a somber mood here, but as I said earlier to Joffrey, happy 9-11, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Um, yes, as I had said earlier, I was like, hey, happy 9-11, because, you know, I had no idea what's going to be thought of, and I even tried to bring along poems that were happier sounding, but, um, for some reason, since I've been doing periodic table poems, I had one for this element, but I thought, I'm going to write one on 9-11, so I wrote a lot of stuff today, and I came up with this, and John thought it was alright, so, I thought I would play music from the Ha Man of South Africa in the Bath of Crown because he's good with music. And actually, he's going to be in town in like a month's time, though I don't know the day or where he's going or what he's doing. Um, but he usually does a really good show, and, and when I find out about it, I'll let everybody know. Um, but this is uh, in reference to sulfur, which is number 13 on the periodic table. This is uh, smelling sulfur on that one. <laughs> I'm a journalist. I can remember the sounds in the news newsroom as I finish my article at one of the computers. I can still hear the sounds of the bustling, of the rushing toward a deadline. The shuffling of papers was a constant presence when you worked. Hearing that low hum, that, that din and action and the activity, it's almost comforting to types like us. It was like a bass beat to the symphony of our lives. So, when you hear the words 911, you think of the number to call when you hear more gun violence on these Chicago streets. The smell that you smell, the, you smell the sulfur and the gunpowder, uh, another sense that accentuates the center of the world around us. But on a beautiful, sunny day like today, you come into the newsroom in the early morning, and that sound of action has yet to truly penetrate the ears of the reporters with a styrofoam cup of coffee in one hand, crumpled pages of edited copy in the other. But on this sunny morning, that din was different, much more cacophonous, much more rushed, but still so hushed. I, I made them on one of the TV sets along the main wall. Uh, all TVs were on different channels, showing different bits of news, though all suddenly seemed the same. I looked like, a, like the, it looked like the newsroom was watching a movie as smoke poured from one of the Twin Towers. I try to make the out of me the voices from the TV sets, and then I witnessed a plane right before my eyes fly into the other tower. I stood there for a moment, transfixed like some horror movie addict, before I thought of our contacts scattered along the East Coast. I pulled out my cell phone and I tried quickly speed dial Mark in New York. He had a meeting scheduled in the Twin Towers, Towers that morning, but the phone was jammed, so I dialed up Don, who was in town there that week, but all of this loss to computer simulated voices, forcing me to leave messages and scramble from afar. As pathetic as we were, we stared at TVs as more forms, as all forms of communications were then cut off for us. Was this an attack on New York? We, we struggled to discover until less than 20, 40 minutes later, we saw the two second long film replayed repeatedly from a DC security camera that caught a collision course crashing of a plane through the outer rings of the Pentagon. Well, now the story has changed. 
trying to get through to Dan in D.C. He was he there in the Pentagon today? The phones still cut me off, and so we scrambled for any data, looking for a Chicago connection. The Sears Tower, the John Hancock Building, those are national icons that may be under attack. But before we could gain our bearings, only 25 minutes passed before a plane crashed into the ground near Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Shanksville, I thought. I, I know somebody there. I, I searched and found Anna's number. But who was that kidding? Those lines were cut off, too. It's a strange feeling, being a reporter and not being able to contact a single person, being detached from any lead, coupled with a sickening feeling, a sinking feeling, wondering if any of the people you know are physically hurt or even alive. As a journalist, you really feel hopeless, like your hands are tied behind your back. We give the news. We're not supposed to feel so stranded. An hour after the Pentagon was attacked, the Sears Tower was evacuated. This wasn't my beat. I, I have no contacts and no one to help me through this disaster. So I waited there in case others needed any assistance. I, I sat back for a moment left there to wait, thinking about Mark and Don in New York, Dan in D.C., even poor Anna. I I'm sure she's not hurt, but they're now cut off to me. As I said, all I could do was wait. Clear your head of the people. I, I could hear myself say to myself, you're a reporter. Just break down the details, what you see, instead of thinking of, this is just another one of your human interest articles. Uh, all that jet fuel, uh, the drywall, all that paper in those offices, those people trapped. They're all hydrogen, carbon, oxygen. But, but, but wait a minute. In Chicago, I think of the sulfur smell when it comes to gunfire. But jet fuel is sulfur laden. That burning drywall emits sulfur gas. Sulfur is even the third most common mineral in the human body. I mean, I'm a newspaper reporter. I know that sulfur based compounds are used in pulp and paper industries. Yeah, I'm a newspaper reporter. Just take a breath and turn your head to the stack. To clear my head of the humanity, the thought of so much sulfur being so much a part of so many details in our lives, made me think of the destruction that sulfur was so much a part of today. I know I stayed here to give a helping hand, but with all that sulfur on my mind, suddenly all I could smell was the burning. <laughs> And I couldn't stop coughing while I tried to catch my breath. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. And no, that was just, I wasn't planning on doing something moody and lame and inappropriate, but you know, as I said, like any other ha holiday, happy new loving. So, yeah. um, and speaking of, I'm hoping this man, I'm, I'm so interested in what he's going to share for us. So please, Joffrey, come on up here. Give it up for Joffrey Stewart. Come on up I'll do three, uh, two of them mine. This first one is from the veteran. The 
veteran is a paper. A paper of Vietnam Veterans Against the War. That was the first veterans organization. They really became an anti-war organization. All the VFW and all the others were too patriotic to <laughs> be anti-war. <laughs> and this one is by a William J. Writer. And will help me use my glasses. The title is Jimmy. It was a it was a hall, an old movie house really, in the city of St. Francis, near the ocean called Peace. A great snake like chick jumping in the blue white strobe lights, amorphous light shows, pulsing walls, all just a prologue to Hendrix. He came out at last, a pro imitation of a black rag doll escaping from some absurd Beckett cast. Surely a tragedy or farce was about to unfold in the silver, silver screenless, seatless theater above a stone blue cloudy crowd. He violently struck left-handed Upside down strings of bell-bottom blue heron with piercing dark eyes, heavy with one guitar string, guitar wing. He looked down as if into San Francisco's blue bay, as if from Coit's high tower, as if to jump from another huge hurdy bird. I pushed to the front to hear his voice soft wings. The wind cries, Mary, gliding around us, around the statue of St. Francis. In the city of St. Francis, near the ocean called Peace, a cable car, cable car hushing up Telegraph Hill. I wanted to know about over there, so he played a lot of purple haze. Murderous intent on Hey Joe, pain of rejection, star spangled banner with his true blue taps near the end. Jimmy left the stage that night prophesying his own end, which eventually came street easy, a barbiturate permanent sleep. He was right on, however, about over there. And as he knew, coming back was worse. William J. Ryder. Uh, the title of this one is Happy New Year. And it's dedicated to all the empty seats that were here last Wednesday and last Monday at Weeds and apparently again today. The epigraph is from Sherman Skolnick, who was reported murdered by Mossad seven years ago last May, report from an anonymous source. New York City firemen! There were bombs in the building. Cyberspaceorbit.com. Crucial info evidence. Explosives toppled WTC. When our increasingly free thinking time under attack from Boko Haram is reckoned from the time a kind of anarchist was born as much as 6 BC. In the middle of the time, 
reckon from the unlikely time that a wolf gave its nature to the birth of Rome, 5774 comes right at the time a false flag attack scam to Larry Silverstein seven billion dollars for setting up the sabotage of his World Trade Center. 5774 at an equally Zionizing time when Syria having turn the other cheek, if a state can do that, four times to air strikes from an Israel that never seems to get rid of its sins, is mooted Syria to give up chemicals that Putin says jihadists use to kill 1,400 people. The age of miracles is not over, especially in the confusion that diplomacy brings to rational belief. And this one, uh, works off those words we were given last week to... Yay! Really? I suck at it, dude, dude, but you're absolutely awesome! Wow, <laughs> yeah. oh, what yeah. words? And where are they? Uh, slithering... Slithering <laughs> intestinal worms? Intestinal worms? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, ye
It is well to remember that our real enemies speak English, but also Hebrew. Colin Powell speaks Yiddish. Does Dov Zakheim speak Hebrew? Hebrew, the Gusano lingo with which Mohammed Atta addressed his Las Vegas whore. Because it was not some Arab who planted some mini nukes in Larry Silverstein's sub basements. Somebody had to let them in. He and Giulani, 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 yeah, said, pull in the jargon of professional demolition and in the excellent English of BBC, <laughs> the destruction of Building 7 was announced 20 minutes before it happened. <laughs> AE911truth.org Your real enemies speak English as well as American. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh. Oh, oh. oh my God, that was awesome. I, I can't believe I didn't even think of doing that because I'm an idiot. Put saloon and everything in there. Oh my God, thank you for remembering that. Now I'm going to have to say that this is, well, just to try to bring the words up more, this is the bestest saloon ever. <laughs> I don't know what I might say, right? Um, I was going to, um, because I do publishing stuff, and I won't read anything from the new issues of CC and D Down in the Dirt because I'm a wench that way. Um, I like to read things periodically from After the Apocalypse. This is a poetry collection book, but it also is a 2013 date book, which is really awesome because I'll have a poem with every week. It was really cool. And so I thought I'd go back one and read this one from Larry Shug. I had no idea what magazine it was for, but it was short, so I'm going to read it for you. It's Confession, with no penance so far. Oh, I done bad deeds down in Atlanta. Sneaky little bastard I was back then. Got away with them, too. 25 years later, I think back to them bad old days. I don't admit to the evil I've done, not even to myself anymore. Things be going too good. I swear, and I just recently got a thing from somebody that's like, oh, by the way, I love your little date bucket. And I'm like, I love, I use that, I plan all sorts of crap. Oh, wait, yeah. And what I'm holding here, which I'll have to, Trying to run like da 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 da. There's a handy dandy little bag, and I want everybody, trust me, our phenomenal, phenomenal feature this evening is Dallas and Malice Plum. We've got guitar, so we also have a star singer, so you have no idea. I'm like, I don't go hunt her down and be like, you must feature here because I hurt you so. And so I'm going to, even to the next open mic, or I'm going to hunt you down and say, you have to put money in. Because anyway, well, I know everyone will because she's so worth it. So everybody think about it. I suppose if you are really cheap and want to give change, we can allow that. But, you know. I think last week somebody gave a gold coin. Here's a gold silver do gold dollar. To, and I'm like, what? You got a gold coin? <laughs> I'll take a gold coin. <laughs> well, I don't have any this week. I don't have one. I'm sorry. But, like, you know, I guess coin is fine because, you know, quarters fill meters or whatever, so whatever you can do, you can do, and we love you for it, and Jerry, my darling, I hope he's going to get it on up here, get it on up for Jerry Pendergast, please! No, I'm stupid tall. Thoughts on my first day of college. My first day of college was 9-11. 1973. <laughs> Catching a breeze from a window, 
legs crossed, cards in hand. I deal on top of my floor mattress to six imaginary opponents, four familiar, two unnamed. Allman Brothers, I was born a rambling man, accompanying my drill. Bulletin from the local announcer. We have received word that Chilean soldiers are marching toward the presidential palace in Santiago. Stay tuned for a further word. I finished dressing, place cards back in box. Local announcer. President Allende is dead. I grabbed my notebooks. First class was English 101, where I read Or I'll Dress You in Mourning, biography of El Carva Base, son of a Frente Popular, sorry, Frente Popular soldier in the Spanish Civil War. First I had heard or read of the Spanish Civil War. Reading Fahrenheit 451 on 912, the day they picked up Victor Hara and thousands of students and other professors at Universidad. <laughs> Reports on TV asking soldiers, why are you burning this books? These books are bad. No questions about any people in the soccer stadium. Women harassed by soldiers for wearing pants. They cut them with bayonets. Hey, hey. Oh, page two, it was two pages. So you don't think I write that much stuff on one page, do you? <laughs> okay, uh, we met tens of people I knew first week at City College. News from Chile disappeared from the front pages and lead stories, along with the rounded up until a photo appeared of a North American student killed for having a book by Karl Marx assigned in a class. Anaconda extracted copper from Chile in ground, paid lousy wages and no taxes, confiscated, cried to Washington, read that this was a major reason for the coup later on. Anaconda also can be a crazy form of poker where cards are passed to opponents or a giant snake that suffocates. 9-11-13, people in Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador fight with mining companies from El Norte in their villages and in the courts for usable water and crops. The assassins don't wear uniforms like Pinochet. <laughs> Highway poem. Two lanes, late afternoon. Fog forming. Flatlands turning to slopes. Deer crossing signs. No crossing guards for them, I say to an imaginary passenger. Foggy dusk, I slow down, just a shadow, or was it? Looked for a second, like a legendary lost woman. Lived in a town nearby, I heard. Her height and her hair color changed with the decades. My fantasy gallery display. Action portraits of Gil Scott Heron and the late Seamus Haney, side by side. Warrior poets use cuss words selectively and well-timed. Words strong, physical, and rhythmic. Um, this is going to be a mellow, quiet old uh, open mic. And yes, I am going to call Jerry Reynolds up because he can bug me smoochy smoochy. But I want to read two that were happier.
because I seemed like I felt like I'm a, I was on a static thing of some sort there. So these are older pieces of mine, and this one, first one is called Gary's Blind Date. A friend of mine had a roommate named Gary, and Gary was a man who was always down on his luck. So on one particular occasion, after Gary had a dating dry spell, my friend decided to set Gary up on a blind date. Now, he said, this girl is beautiful. She's funny. You'll think she's great. Trust me. Pick her up Friday night. And Friday came, and Gary, feeling more and more apprehensive, said, but, but, but I'm not feeling well. I, I've been sick all week. And my friend said, no, I don't want to hear any excuses. You're going. <laughs> so Gary got ready for his blind date and drove over to the girl's house. She looked at her parents, and when Gary rang the doorbell, the girl's mother answered. Oh, you must be Gary. Please, come in, she said. Once Gary got in the house, the mother said, that my daughter isn't getting, isn't, you know, still getting ready. Would you like to wait? And Gary, still not feeling very well, asked where the washroom was. She directed him to the newly remodeled basement. Gary walked into the brand new bathroom. New fixtures, thick, white, wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. Gary sat down on his new ivory throne, still sick. But when he looked over, there was no toilet paper. <laughs> he couldn't just stand up. He thought, this isn't one of those regular trips to the bathroom. I need something to clean myself up with. He couldn't use a towel, so he took the oil off of his pants and he used his underwear. But he couldn't leave the underwear in the small open trash can in the corner of this newly remodeled bathroom, he thought. So he dropped them into the toilet <laughs> and flushed, which caused the toilet to overflow, causing the newly remodeled bathroom to look less than new. <laughs> so here was Gary's dilemma. He had left his underwear in the toilet and defiled the family's brand new bathroom all without even getting the chance to introduce himself to his date. <laughs> what are his options? What are his options? So the only thing he thought he could do in this situation was climb out the window <laughs> of the bathroom and then drive home. <laughs> When he, when he arrived at his apartment so early from his date, his roommates had to ask. And after that, he never set Gary up on a blind date again. But <laughs> 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 I mean, I wasn't my friend Gary, but my friend's friend. The whole thing. Anyway, so then I thought I'd do this because you know, if you come home and you're like, I can watch news or I can see the beginning of The Simpsons, and you could see the beginning and see Bart write some message on the blackboard, and it's always different in every episode. For some reason, a while ago, I put some of them together, and these are lessons from The Simpsons. <laughs> I will not bribe Principal Skinner. I will not send lard in the mail. I will not hide the teacher's Prozac. I will not hang donuts from my person. I will not aim for the head. I will not barf unless I'm sick. I will not conduct my own fire drills. I will not snap bras. I will not fake seizures. I will not prescribe medication. I will not bury the new kid. I will not sell school property. I will not trade pants with others. <laughs> I will not drive the principal's car. I will not pledge allegiance to Satan. I will not even pledge allegiance to Bart. I will not belch the national anthem. 
I do not have diplomatic immunity. <laughs> I am not deliciously saucy. <laughs> I will not torment the emotionally frail. I will not sell land in Florida. I will not grease the monkey bars. I will not hide behind the Fifth Amendment. I will not sleep through my education. I will not teach others to fly. I will not bring sheep to class. I will not eat things for money. I will not instigate a revolution. I will not call my teacher hotcakes. I will not yell fire in a crowded classroom. I will not Xerox my butt. I will not yell she's dead at roll call. I will not charge admission to the bathroom. A burp is not an answer. Bag man is not a legitimate career choice. Coffee is not for kids. The principal's toupee is not a frisbee. Goldfish don't bounce. Five days is not too long to wait for a gun. Tar is not a plaything. Spitwads are not free speech. Mud is not one of the four food groups. No one is interested in my underpants. The cafeteria deep fat fryer is not a toy. The Pledge of Allegiance does not end with Hail Satan. Organ transplants are best left to professionals. Underwear should be worn on the inside. I will not expose the ignorance of the faculty. I saw nothing unusual in the teacher's lounge. This punishment is not boring and pointless. I read that at like a thing for Yammer and they never have features when it's a mini feature because I was leaving because I was moving to Intercourse, Pennsylvania, but we moved back. But <laughs> as, as enticing as Intercourse, Pennsylvania was, we moved back. Um, <laughs> I like Chicago. Anyway, um, Jerry Reynolds, I can't see. There you are, my darling, please. We're going to give it a few before we get a break here. Give it up for Jerry Reynolds. So get on up here. I was the you. Oh, Pashaw. Oh, Pashaw. That was the funniest thing in class when somebody had to read something and they had Shaw and they're like, um, oh, Pashaw. And we all just burst into laughter even though none of us knew how to say it. So, oh, so how do you oh, say Pashaw. Oh, I mean, the P is silent, but. I think so. I say, oh, Pashaw. <laughs> anyway, go. Go to the mic so that we can see. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jerry Reynolds. Hi, Jerry Reynolds. Howdy. I wish everybody here a beautiful evening of 9 11. Happy 9 11! And, you know, it's not like 7 11, it's like 9 11, where we're supposed to remember something that happened 12 years ago. And it tires me. I would like to remember that something that happened 50 years ago. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butt in because you don't know this. But you say, oh, it's not like 7-Eleven. 7-Eleven is the day I almost died in 1998. So it's another horrific day. Oh, thank heaven for the day I <laughs> We all have our little stories, don't we? We're never things. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> I'm going to recite without having anything in my pocket other than uh, all the digits on a bill. And lint. And lint. And lint. No. Here's what happened after that march on Washington. Please remember a couple of days ago when all the news was about Martin Luther King and the largest march on Washington. Over 360,000 people. Or, if you listen to somebody else, 
Less than 402, 30,000 people. Whites, blacks, before we became Caucasian and <laughs> other. And she still joshes me. Here's a very important thing that happened to me that I'm trying to remember all the details from and you might help me if I touch my head. That shortly after the major march on Washington, Martin Luther King was assassinated. And I wasn't there to witness it, but on the night when it happened, I was living at 6161 North Lamont in Saganash, in the city of Chicago, the state of Illinois. And there was a planning party for my grandparents' 50th wedding anniversary. And they were not invited. <laughs> but my mother, my father, two of my brothers, And, and, and two uncles and two aunts, or they might have been second cousins, quite removed, or whatever, all got together in order to make sure that my grandparents were going to have the happiest of 50th wedding anniversaries. And two of the people that were invited, my uncle and my aunt, got a, something thrown through their front windshield on their way from the south side to the north side of Chicago by Kaminsky Park or where, wherever it happened to be, but they still got there in order to celebrate this beautiful event, just the planning of the event. And it was... Can I say the word hell? Where the hell were they? Where did they come what happened? What, where, how are we getting? We got all together. And the beautiful thing is, two beautiful people who love each other so much that they give birth to other chief people that like love each other. And we're trying to plan this out so effectively and nobody's able to get there on time except for, okay. We got lasagna, we got the hors d'oeuvres, we got the other stuff. <gasps> Did anybody get hurt? None of our family. A decision was made once everybody was there. Because Anna and Gregory loved each other so much. And didn't need it on the gifts that a chalice would be bought for one of the rectors in one of the churches in Vietnam where my cousin Richard was serving. And the beautiful thing to me is I have another cousin, Richard, on the other side of the family. Don't mean to put my hand out this way, but I got two cousins, Richard. And funds were raised in order to create a chalice to deliver the blood of Christ in Vietnam. Rather than giving my grandparents money that they don't need me to have or anything like that. But my uh, cousin Sue Doyle, who happened to be there, said, we got to give them some mementos or something like that. And the beautiful thing was, I was right and she was right. And the memento was the entire family doing a bad impersonation of Debbie Reynolds doing Tammy's in Love, including 
stand still. And two little pieces of art, folk art, that were cut out of tin cans. Tin, not aluminum cans, but they had tin. It was that long ago. That looked like rocking chairs. It's beautiful to know that they were spray painted gold and the embroidery around the seats was cut excellently. And I have the wonderful opportunity to tell you that there is something more important than 9 11. <laughs> there are two people that, although they're dead, are still much more <laughs> than you are looking at me. And my name is Jerry Reynolds. I actually want to read this little Twitter link thing because that's the reason why I started a Twitter account so that I could write very, very, very short poems. And I include something that he had said. Very short Twitter thing called You Can't Tell. Jerry said that his brother said, the angel and the animal put on their clothes, but now that they're dressed, you can't tell the difference. Twitter link comes You're like, I didn't mean that when I said that story. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. I know, everybody can take different things from things. And you can, once they're dressed, you can think, oh my gosh, that's so obvious, the difference is. But anyway, sorry, I had to do that. I'm like, find this, I'm gonna see if I can spit that out. I saw a man who just recently featured, who just show up because somebody's gonna show up like, happy 9-11, ah. So maybe Mr. Hargraves will get on up here. Ladies and gentlemen, get over Don Hargraves, come on up. Got this thing printed up. <laughs> oh, I yes. awesome. And I'm going to read from it. The title of the book is Suicide Alley. I'm going to read from chapter one. Hey, buddy, what's up? A woman's voice said to Robert from behind. Robert turned around, noticed the woman was a cop. He smiled and said, Just wandering around. You new here? I guess. Not sure I got here. Well, I can't allow for the homeless or other malcontents to hang out here, but if you need a place to stay, I would suggest Hannah Hall. They rent rooms to people like you, and they even allow people to figure out what to do here before charging rent. Well, where would that be, ma'am? First, learn my name. It's Mallory Jones. Okay, Mallory. My name is Robert Harvey. Where is Hannah Hall at? It's over in that direction, Mallory says she pointed to the west. The building will be surrounded all but the front part by the pea soup fog, but you'll be able to go around to wherever you need within the building. When you get there, ask for Janice. She's slight of build and overly quiet, but no one, not one to be messed with. Thank you. Robert started off in the direction that Mallory pointed. Eventually, he found a wall of fog showing up on one side. He continued in that direction as well as he could. Then he saw the wall of fog showing up on both sides of him. So Mallory told Daryl, there is a building standing right between the two walls of fog, not being touched by either wall, but not really needing much space to squeeze between the fog and the building. He looked at the entrance and noticed the word Hannah chiseled in the granite above the main entrance to the building. He stepped inside and noticed a sheet of paper with daily, weekly, and monthly rental rates bit listed on the notice board. A frail looking woman who looked to be in her 50s looked at Robert and said, Need a room? I believe so, Robert replied. How'd you find out about this place? Company Mallory directed me here. I know her. She usually directs good people to this place. So what's your name and how long will you need it? My name's Robert Harvey. I'm looking for a place to spend the night. And your name is? My name's Janice Wingate and I'm the landlady, she said as she dug through the keys. Anyway, stay for the night and if it turns into a week with no chance of escape, I suggest you check the job board. I can give a few free days, but after a while you have to earn your keep. They all do that after a while, assuming they have decide to hold on for a while. <laughs> hold on for a while. What is it that people do here? Robert said as he looked at the key. And it was the number 305. 
a number of, th a number of things. You hang out long enough, you get to know, and many people end up hanging around for a long while. How do I get to the room? Hold on a second minute. Let me check on things. Janice says she picked up the phone and dialed a number. After a few rings, a voice was heard on the other line. How long will the cleanup be? I got someone in need of a room for the night, Janice said into the phone. Then after some more chats, she said, thanks, he'll wait for it, and hung up the receiver. Then to Robert, she said, feel free to sit a while. Your room is getting cleaned up at the moment. Robert sat down on one of the chairs in the room and looked through the various papers scattered around the place. Most of the man had acted as advertisements for things to do around the area. Nothing told him anything he needed to know. After a while, he heard the phone ring again, and Janice answered. Hello, what's up? She said, and then, I don't believe any of any other rooms available. I know there's a couple other men who I haven't heard from for a while, but that room is the only one I'm sure of, followed by, Look, shell shock, seems to be going through some rough times. He'll probably not notice the vibes for a while. By the time he starts, we should have a different room ready for him, and, and is setting him up now. Then to Robert, your room is ready, just get up to the third floor, turn right, and you should be able to find the room from there. No alcohol is allowed in the building, nor do I allow smoking of any kind. Tobacco, pot, synthetic pot, cloves, crank, crack, ice, bath salts, or whatever the government creates for the lower classes to destroy themselves with next. I ask for two weeks' notice before you leave, although the way this place works, I'll be happy with two minutes' notice. I remember the rules, and thanks, Robert said to Janice. Then he walked up to the stairs and to the right, he found the room open, and entered it. You must be the new lady resident, Elliot said. I guess, Robert replied. I assume she's giving you the basic rules of the place. She has, although with a bit of snark. Sounds like her. I must ask that I add that I suggest you wait 24 hours before picking up this picture frame here. Elliot said as he pointed to a picture frame that was placed with the picture towards the tabletop. Elliot ordered, then ordered the other three men out of the room. Once they left, Elliot turned to Robert and said, one final thing, give up hope for escape. I've yet to see anyone escape from this place. Indeed, too many people work themselves into a tizzy, only to find their hopes dashed in the end. They usually end up damning themselves in some way to everlasting torture, and it comes from having a hope they shouldn't have. So give up hope, you'll live better for it. He then left the room. Robert put the stuff around the room. He then stripped his clothes off and got himself to bed. After some time, to get used to the noises going on below him, he slipped to a fitful sleep. Awesome, yeah. yeah. And what I really like as mellow as this is because, you know, we can't get all raucous on 9 11. But it's very cool that we had like short story stuff going on as well as poetry and, and whatever came out this evening. But I want everybody to take a five minutes break because I think there are a bunch of people that want to keep dressing busy while our phenomenal feature, Dallas Mella, sets up our. Guys, I'm going to plug in my, my amp for my guitar and I'll be extra double plus cool. So just give it five minutes and we'll be right back with a great, great feature.